What is your concept of an angel? What do you think of when you think of the word angels? Those of us from California, what do we think about? It used to be called the California Angels, then they switched to the Anaheim Angels, then they switched to the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. <laughs> they can't figure out who they are, what they're, they're having an identity crisis, but we think of a baseball team. Others think of Warren Beatty. Think of Angels, think of, some think of Michael Landon. Some think of these wings and feathers. Indeed, the Talmud tells us that on Friday night, two angels accompany each person as he returns home from shul. So as we go from shul to our dining room tonight, angels are going to accompany us. And when these angels enter our homes, when we walk home Friday night, and they find the table set for Shabbat with the Shabbos candles and the challah, they bless the home and all of its inhabitants. So much is this part of Jewish tradition from the most religious to the most secular, that the song that we sing Friday night, Shalom Aleichem, what is that song about? What are the next two words? Malachei Hashores, we greet the angels that joined us at our Shabbat table. In our prayers, we make constant reference to the angels. The Torah is filled with accounts of angels. Let's see how many you remember. Adam and Eve encountered an angel who blocked the gate to the Garden of Eden after they were expelled. Very early on in the book of Genesis, a child that's studying, voracious, is learning about angels. You remember the story of Hagar and Ishmael? Hagar is sent away and they're thirsty. And they encounter an angel. And the angel says, Malach, Hagar, what's with you, Hagar? Go dig and you'll find water. And she finds a well of water. Jacob wrestled with an angel. Abraham met three angels. You remember the wrestling match, Jacob and an angel? That's where we get our name Israel from. Yisrael comes from that he wrestled with the angel and he prevailed. Joshua, the stories with Joshua and angels. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, each saw angels. Even Bilam, the corrupt prophet, saw an angel. So Malachim, angels are real and central within Judaism. How do they appear? What do they look like? Sometimes they're completely invisible. Sometimes there's no visual at all. They're there, they're guarding you, but you don't see them. And sometimes they take on physical human forms. These are the angels that we see in the Torah. That Abraham encounters these angels. And although there is a minority opinion that even that was just a visual, that they weren't actually physical, majority of Jewish commentators say they took on a physical form. They looked like human beings. They acted like human beings. They weren't totally human, as the verse says, and they ate with Abraham. And Rashi, the commentator, says they appeared as if they were eating. They were angels. They don't actually digest food, but they could make believe that they're eating. Sometimes they disclose their identity. Sometimes they let the individual in the story know that they're an angel. Sometimes their identity remains hidden. For example, I want to show you a little story in the Torah, a short verse. The story is actually the longest story in the Bible. Does anyone know what the longest story in the Bible is? Raise your hand. What takes up more room than any other story of the Bible? Yes. Exactly. Very good. Very good. Story of Joseph. Longest story in the Bible. Surprising. It's not the story of the binding of Isaac. It's not the story of Abraham. It's not the story of Jacob. It's the story of Joseph. Takes up more pages of the Bible than any other story. Now, the story is, it, it, and the reason that it, it's so powerful of a story, and it has, it has so much drama to it, it has every aspect that would make someone on Broadway want to turn it into a show. Because it has everything. It's got suspense, it's got drama, it's got a little bit of romance in it. It's got a lot of different things. It's got a family feud, it's got a unity of the family coming back together, it has the aged father. It's got so much excitement to it. How does it all begin? It begins, you know, Joseph is getting the brothers a little jealous. He's got the coat of many colors, he's showing it off. And then the brothers go off onto this uh, shepherding. And Jacob says to Joseph, they're late coming back. Could you go find them? And he goes to the city, and he doesn't find them. They're not there. Now, Joseph can now come back home and say, Dad, I went, I looked, 
they weren't there, and the story would come to an end. That's not what happens. Joseph encounters someone, doesn't tell me who, and this person says to Joseph, whom are you looking for? Most of you do that all the time, right? You see someone in the street and you say, whom are you looking for? It's a very strange encounter. And he says, I'm looking for my brothers. And he says, oh, the brothers, I saw them, really. And I actually was near them and I was listening to what they were saying. That happens all the time. And they said, we're going to go from here to Dosan. So your brothers are in Dosan. And Joseph then goes out and he goes to Dosan. And then what happens? Everything else that we know about Jewish history comes forth from there. The brothers see him. I mean, let's go quickly. The brothers see him and they, they, well, they'll plot against him. And then they say, no, we can't kill him. They throw him in the pit and they throw him in the pit. And then they Ishmael him, take him out of the pit. And they go ahead and they sell him as a slave. And he ends up in Egypt and he ends up there. And it's a Potiphar, Potiphar's wife accuses him of attempted rapes. So he gets thrown into prison. He gets thrown into prison. And then what happens? He gets thrown into prison. He meets the two people there, right? They had this dream. They don't know what's going on. Like, yeah, they take him out of there. Pharaoh has a dream a few years later. Take him out of there. Oh, seven cows, seven this, seven this, seven years, a famine. And on and on and on we go. What happens from there? Joseph becomes viceroy over all of Egypt. Hey, let's go to the next scene. Let's go back to Jacob. What's happening with Jacob? They're hungry. There's no food over there. So go down to Egypt and bring food. We're going to starve to death. Oh, no, okay. We're going to go down to Egypt. They're going down to Egypt. They have to meet the viceroy. The viceroy recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. On and on the story goes until what we have is the reunion of the Jewish family. And Jacob comes down to Egypt. What happens then? Book of Exodus begins. Book of Exodus begins. The Jewish people are enslaved in Egypt. Pharaoh, on and on and on we go. Then we're enslaved. Then goes the ten plagues, splitting the Red Sea. Matzah balls, right? Passover comes. Sinai comes. Shavuot comes. Everything else that we know about our history, about our heritage, about the Jewish people unfolds from one simple verse. I overheard your brothers and they said, let's go to Dosan. Take that verse out. I don't know if we're here. I don't know where we would be. And that would be a bloody shame because it's a nice place here. So who was the stranger? Who was he? I don't know. The Torah does not tell me that it was an angel, that it wasn't an angel. The Torah says he bumped into somebody. And perhaps the fact that the Torah leaves this person mysteriously, no identity, is really the most important message that we get from that verse. You never know. You never know. You just don't know if that encounter has been preset into motion by God Almighty. Because from that simple little encounter, who knows what will unfold. The entire world will be different because the entire world will now have a nation that will be a chosen people that will bring a light unto the nations from one small encounter. Random occurrences do not exist in Judaism. It is not random whether they're angels, spiritual angels, physical angels, human being angels, every encounter should be treated as if we've just encountered an angel. In April of 1944, the Nazis Yamach entered the once vibrant city of Munkach to round up all the Jews and place them into ghettos. A month later, they were forced into boxcars on their way to Auschwitz. Among those on board on this journey was a 17-year-old boy named Shlomo Zalman. It was in the middle of the night when the trains arrived at this most horrible place on earth. Hundreds of men, women, and children were herded off the train and told to stand on this infamous line. Shlomo Zalman had no clue where he was, why he was there, what this was all about. And he also had absolutely no idea what this line meant and what the man on the front of the line that were pointing some people to the right and some people to the left, what that meant. Suddenly from out of, the, out of the darkness, a man, a skeleton of a man, rushes up to him, grabs him by his arms, and whispered to him in Yiddish, in what year were you born? I was born in 1927, the boy said. No, you were not. You were born in 1925. And don't forget it. What year were you born? 1925. Good. And he raced off. A few minutes later, the boy was at the front of the line and he was asked the question. In what year were you born? 1925. He was motioned to the right. It was only days later that he found out that the cutoff age 
was 18 years old. Anyone under 18 that night were executed that night. The boy Shleim Zalman would survive Auschwitz and two other camps. He lives today in Los Angeles. His name is Saul Teichman. And Saul Teichman has his name on yeshivas and day schools and mikvahs all over the country. He has devoted himself to rebuilding the Jewish world. And not a day goes by that he doesn't think about this encounter of this mysterious man, a man he never saw again. Was he an angel? Shleim Zalman, Saul Teichman doesn't know. But perhaps, perhaps he was even a greater angel, a human being acting like an angel, a human being acting with goodness and caring about another human being. And that's what I would like to focus on. Human beings who transcend their own selves and come to us as angels. Elie Wiesel once finished giving a lecture in a certain city when he was approached by one of the members of the audience. And she says, I'm sure you've been asked the question all the time, and I know it's a long shot, but you said in your talk that you were in Buchenwald. My father was also in Buchenwald around the same time. Did you know my father? And he asked the name, and she said the name of her father. And Elie Wiesel begins to cry. He says, did I know your father? Did I know your father? We shared bunks together. And you know what your father did the entire time that we were there? Your father sang songs. And the woman smiles because she knew that's all her father ever did, was always sing songs. Even there, Elie Wiesel said, he sang songs. That's all he would do. He said, every day, life got worse and worse, Wiesel said. There was nothing left to live for. And so like many, I contemplated suicide. And I got hold of some poison, a pill, that I would be able to take and end it all. And I decided, let's end this. This is ridiculous. This is not life. There's nothing to live for. It's only sadness and horror and pain. I'm going to end it. So one day I went to the bunk in the middle of the day, and that's where I was going to end my life. And I walk in, and what do I find? I find your father. And he's singing. And he's singing songs of my youth. And I said, how can you sing at a place like this. And your father turned to me and he said, Ellie, all we have is our song. And our song they cannot take away from us. These animals can take away our limbs, they can take our bodies, but they cannot take away our song. Don't ever let them take away our song. I'm alive today, Ellie Wiesel says to this woman, because of your father. Human beings that act as angels. In 1940, as Hitler was tightening his net of evil and madness around Eastern Europe, and Jews were running for their lives, many made their way to Lithuania. Lithuania at the time was annexed by the Soviet Union. Thousands more came from Poland to seek refuge. The people could see the writing on the wall. The Nazis would soon invade, and they would be captured as well. Someone discovered a loophole. And they discovered through the Dutch and Soviet councils that would be able to grant the Jews of Lithuania safe haven out if only they would somehow get hold in their hands of a Japanese visa. How do you get a Japanese visa? The Japanese consulate at the time in Lithuania was a one-man operation administered by a very humble man named Chiyun Sugihara. Someone approached Chiyun Sugihara and explained, all the Jews here we're going to be murdered. The only way our lives can be saved is if you issue us a Japanese visa that will allow us out of Lithuania, that would give us safe haven, and we could survive. Chiyun Sugihara writes that he had a discussion with his wife. The two of them talked it over. They took a look at the refugees. They knew that their government would say absolutely not and in their own words, I may have to disobey my government, but if I don't, I would be disobeying God. And so from July 31st until August 28th, 1940, Chiyun Sugihara sat for hours signing visas, hour after hour, day after day. He wrote them with his own hands, knowing that his days were going to be numbered in the consulate as soon as his government would find out what he would do, he wouldn't sleep. 
His wife would massage his hands as he would continue to write right hand. She would massage the right hand, he would write with the left, back and forth. She would feed him food while he sat and wrote so he shouldn't stop writing. He had but a few hours sleep each night so that he continue writing visas. Eventually, the Japanese government got wind of his actions and they ordered his transfer to Berlin. Up until the very last minute, he didn't stop writing visas. On the car ride over to the train station, he continued to write and throw them out the window to the Jewish people racing around his car. When he got to the train station, he continued to write visas, throwing the visas out the window of the train, and in the last minute, taking the actual Japanese stamp and throwing that out the window as well. Every one of those visas turned into a life saved. 6,000 Polish Jews were issued those visas and survived. The second largest number of Jews saved during World War II. In 1945, the Japanese government unceremoniously dismissed Chiyun Chiy Sugihara from diplomatic service. They exiled him and his family for being disobedient against his government. It was only in later years that this man would receive the recognition he deserved. You see, the last visa that got out of that train window fell into the hands of someone that became a Knesset member later in the Israeli government. And he was determined to find who was that man. The rest of the people that received these visas had no idea who Chi Yun Sigrihara was, what his name was, why he did this, whatever happened to him. It was a mystery until later on, until this Knesset member found him and brought his story out. And in 1985, he was honored in Yad Vashem. A postscript to the story, those of you that were with me yesterday, and I talked about the train at my father's yeshiva, how he missed that train, and how he, had he got on that train, he wouldn't have survived. What happened to that group of students? They made their way to Lithuania. On August 15, 1940, Chiyun Sugihara issued visa number 1778 to a 17-year-old yeshiva boy named Mordechai Brzezinski, my father. I had the opportunity in my life to meet and befriend Shiyun Sugihara's son, Hiroki Sugihara. And we became close friends. And Hiroki gave over to me copies of visas that his father saved. His father saved lists of every single visa he gave out. Do you know what it's like to look at a piece of paper and see visa 1778 issued? on the day it was issued, and have your father's name there. In the years, the past, we had Hiroki speak throughout the country about his father, about his mother, about their heroics. Unfortunately, Hiroki passed away two years ago of an illness. Angels, angels in our midst, human beings disguised as angels. They come to us. They do things that others do not do. They put their lives on the line. We have estimated that today there are 45,000 descendants of Sugihara survivors. 45,000 living Jews today because of one man. So we all need to take a few moments and think about the angels in our lives. Who are they? Who are the angels in your life? Perhaps someone who stepped from behind the shadows of his own world to help you, to heal you, to comfort you. Perhaps it was a doctor that cared for you or a parent or a grandparent and went beyond the call of duty. Perhaps it was a nurse that took care of you in a time of need. Perhaps it was a teacher back in school who gave you the courage you needed to get through a semester, to get through a term. Perhaps it's your mother whose unconditional love made you feel so significant and secure that no challenge would seem insurmountable. Or your father, whose patience and warmth gave you what you needed to make the right choices, choices in life. Think about them. Who are the angels in your life? Well, Shlomo Karbach once said that the truth is that those magical Shabbos angels that we talked about earlier, he said, you know who those angels are? It says, when you come home from shul and you see your family around the table, you've come to realize who the real angels in your life are. You look at your children, you look at your spouse, angels in our lives. So let's be thankful to the priceless gift that God has given us to continue on each and every single day 
with the valuable, valuable blessings that we have. And at the same time, it behooves us, if we're going to spend time thinking about the angels in our lives, we have to ask the other question. For whom do we serve as angels? Are we there for others when others need us? Or do we close our eyes? You know, when people are going through difficulty, it's hard to face them. When someone lost a loved one, it's hard to face them. Because we don't want to look at pain. Because when we look at pain, it hurts us. And so rather than face that discomfort, we close our eyes. Not because we're bad people. We just don't like pain. But think from that person. At that particular time in someone's life, they need a friend. They need someone to be there. Even if they don't want to talk about their loss, they just need a friend. Reach out and be a friend. Be an angel to someone. Sometimes a simple phone call, a simple two minutes to someone, I was thinking about you today. Someone you may not have spoken to for six months, for a year, maybe for a decade. Reach out to them and say, hi, how are you? Say hello to someone you'll never know if that encounter changes your destiny from that day on. Visit somebody in the hospital. The Talmud teaches us that the simple visitation takes away part of the illness. And give charity. Be an angel. Whether it's charity to a poor, or charity to an institution, charity to an organization, help build a synagogue, build a mikvah in your community. Be an angel. Because people were angels to you. And all of our society, and especially within the Jewish people, we function so much better when we behave like angels to each other. We live in a chaotic world. There's so much about our lives over which we have absolutely no control. But this we can control. You could look at any mitzvah that you have performed, any good deed that you've done for another, and know you've made a real difference. Do you know how many favors you can do for people when you're part of a Jewish community? The more you study Torah, the more you realize how God built into the system of Torah. He built into it the mitzvah of being there for one another. There's so many opportunities every single moment of every single day. You go to shul, do you realize you take out a Misha Be'erach list of prayer, and you're praying for strangers that you don't know, you're praying for them for their ill. And you're there for them. They don't know you. And you hear about this particular family sitting shiva and you're there for them. And you hear about a bar mitzvah so you celebrate with them. Everything about the Jewish community is meant so that we can be there for one another. Anyone here from San Diego, California? On a Simchas Torah night in San Diego, there was a nine-year-old boy. He was walking home from the Chabad house on Montezuma Road. They just finished the first night of Kafot. The singing and the dancing went on for hours, and the boy on his way home turns to his father and he says, could we bring the Torah home tomorrow on Simcha's Torah itself? And the father says, no, son, the Torah stays in shul. We don't take the Torah home with us. And tears came to the nine-year-old boy's face. And the father understood the tears. Because his wife that year, this boy's mother, was diagnosed with cancer. And she was just home from the hospital. And she couldn't make it to shul. And the boy saw the dancing in the synagogue and felt bad. That mommy couldn't be part of it. That mommy was home. Mommy would always enjoy Simcha's Torah at Chabad, and now she's stuck in bed. Mommy would always dress up beautifully for the holiday. But now she wasn't here. And so the little boy was sad. The next day on Simcha's Torah, Chanesara, his mother, was sitting alone in the living room. And she was thinking about what must be going on in the shul. Thinking about the dancing. And as she's sitting there thinking about it, she hears the tunes and she says, Wow, this is such a powerful thought that I can actually hear singing. But then she glanced out the window and she saw that the entire congregation was on her front lawn with the rabbis and the Torahs and her nine-year-old boy on someone's shoulders. 
dancing for Simchas Torah. And then they all came into the house, and she had the ability to kiss the Torah and to watch her children dance on Simchas Torah. We're angels in other people's lives. And everything about our tradition and everything about Yiddishkeit brings us together as a family so that we can be there for one another. The husband talks about that Simchas Torah and he says, for that Simchas Torah, my congregation, they weren't people. They became a congregation of angels. There is a Simcha, there is a joy, there is a unity, there is a bond that exists in the Jewish community that is like no other on earth. It's the simcha of love. It's the simcha of compassion. It's the simcha, it's the joy of a mitzvah. A Hasidic master once put it this way on Yom Kippur. What do we say in our prayers? We talk about the prayers of the angels, how awesome the prayer of the angels are, that the prayers of mortal man is so small in comparison to the prayers of the angels. Kadosh, 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 Hashem Tzavakos, Maloch, Halaretz, Kavodo. We talk about what the angels say. Even the prayer of Baruch Shem Kavod Machus Olam Vayad is a prayer written by angels. On and on, the whole Fanim Bechayos Hakodesh, Beraj Godo, we talk about the awesomeness of the prayers of angels. The Medrash, in fact, tells us about one of these angels. There's a beautiful angel. I want you to picture this, and those of you that are good in math, try to follow me. This beautiful angel has a thousand heads. Each one of these heads has a thousand tongues. How many tongues are we at right now? Each of these tongues has a thousand voices. Each of these voices has a thousand melodies. And the beauty and the harmony of this angel is unbelievable. Because all of these melodies and all of these songs and all of these voices and all of these tongues and all of these angels, everything together makes one of the most powerful symphony sounds that one can possibly imagine. And they're singing prayers to God. And yet, for all of its beauty, this angel cannot give a morsel of bread to a hungry person. Only you can. The greatest of angels, the most awesome of angels, the angels that can sing the greatest praise to God, cannot take a piece of bread and give it to someone that's hungry. Only a human angel can do that. Only you can do that. The heavenly angels can look out for us. They can protect us. They can direct us. They can advocate for us. But they cannot do the job for us. We have to make it happen. The Torah is not in heaven. The Torah was not given to the angels. It was given to us. The act of good deeds is something that God gave to us to do. Several years ago, on a dark night in the city of Hebron, two Israeli soldiers were on patrol. Suddenly they heard a shot ring out. They looked around, they didn't see anything. One soldier says to the next, eh, probably nothing. The older, other, other soldier says, no, it's got to be something. There was a gunshot, we've got to go find. Maybe somebody is hurt. The other fellow says, it's Hebron. There's shots all the time. You're always listening to gunshots. Just because you hear a gunshot doesn't mean something actually happened. And the other soldier says, no, we have to find. Maybe somebody was hurt. And they begin to look through the alleyways of Hebron. They don't find anything. And the other soldier says, come on, it's enough already. And he says, no, if we're on patrol, we're going to find where that shot came from and maybe someone's hurt. And he begins to run and run and run throughout every single street in Hebron until indeed he finds another member of his patrol unit was shot and was lying on the ground bleeding to death. He lifted him on his shoulders. He took him right away to the camp, rushed him to the hospital, and his life was saved. One would imagine the parents of the saved Israeli soldier want to find the soldier that saved his son's life. And so in the hospital by the emergency room, they asked, where is the soldier that brought him in? He left. Who was he? He asked to be anonymous. What do you mean anonymous? He saved our son's life. We want to hug him. We want to kiss him. We want to thank him. We want to reward him. We want to see him. Sorry. Well, the, these parents had a marketplace in Yerushalayim, a store. So they put it up a sign in their store. And they wrote their story. Our son's life was saved this and this night in the city of Hebron by some Israeli soldier. 
who remains a mystery to us. If you know anything about this person, please let us know. Simply, we want to just say thank you. That's all we want. And the sign stayed there. Months later, someone's in the store, and he sees the sign, and he reads it. And he's staring at the sign, so the storekeeper, a husband and wife, come over to him and say, you know something about this? He says, yeah, I know something about this very, very, very much. What do you know? I was on patrol that night in the city of Hebron. I heard the gunshot. I said, let's ignore it. My friend said, we can't. I gave up. He didn't. He ran like a madman through the streets of Hebron. And he found your son. And he saved your son's life because I gave up. So who is he? He's very shy. He doesn't want his identity known. He doesn't want a big deal made about him. But I'm going to go to him tonight. And I'm going to tell him how important it is for you that they have this need simply to say thank you. Nothing else. No reporters. No news. Simple thank you. And I'll see if I can convince him to do it. A few hours later, he returns with another soldier. This is the fellow that saved your son's life. And they embrace him, and they hug him, and they thank him. And the soldier says, stop, stop. The only reason I came here is to share a story with you. When my friend told me where he saw this sign, I felt I needed to come and talk to you. Many years ago, there was a young couple that got married. They were having an extremely difficult time. He was laid off from a job. They had no money. They lived off whatever welfare the government could give them. And they would go to a particular grocery store. That's where they would do their shopping. And the sweet couple that owned this grocery store took a liking to this couple. And one time they asked them, how come you don't have children? How come no baby stroller? And the woman said, we're poor. And if we bring a child into the world, how are we going to feed the child? How are we going to buy clothes? We don't have any money. We're unemployed. We have nothing. And the man said to this couple, oh, come on. A baby will bring blessings to your life. A baby will bring tremendous amount of spiritual energy that will translate into material blessings. Don't hold back from bringing the greatest gift into this world. Go have a baby. And until then, and until God provides for you, and until you have a job, you can come to this market anytime you want and take what you need. No fees, no prices. Now go make a baby. And the man says, that couple were my parents. And I'm the baby. And you're the reason I'm here. And when I heard that the sign was hanging in this store, the story that brought me into this world, it then dawned on me. I'm not sure if your son's guardian angel was knocking on my door that night saying, don't stop, don't stop. Or perhaps it was my guardian angel that said, you need to repay a debt. Go find the soldier that's been shot. King Solomon writes, cast your bread upon the waters for after many days you will find it. Good deeds have a way of coming back to you. At one time or another, in one form of another, every good deed we do, every act of being an angel to someone else, it will come back to us. The good you've done for someone else will always, always be there for you and for your children and for your grandchildren. That's the nature of goodness. So let's create angels by being angels. When we give and when we share, we create angels of compassion. When we impart faith to one another, we create angels of strength. And when we laugh and we bring joy to one another, we create angels of joy. And those angels will be there to help us and to guide us and to protect us and to advocate on our behalf. We've all heard the expression, seeing is believing. If you see something with your physical eyes, then you could believe it. Well, possibly one can say, believing is seeing. That when you perceive things beyond that which you can see, 
and when you hear and touch things beyond that which the physical eyes, ears, and hands can feel and hear, that's when you really begin to see. When you have faith in something that you don't just visualize with your eyes, that's when you first begin to see. That's when you first began, begin to have vision and clarity and security in this life. You ever wonder why at the Passover Seder, you know, one of the highlights as a child was to see if we can stay up until Elijah comes, right? Because you have the cup in the middle of the table, and you open the door, and Elijah comes in, and then someone gives a little knock on the table, so the wine cup shakes, and you say, you see, Elijah drank that night. I'm sure Elijah has really been happy with this latest Baron Herzog craze of various different types of wine, so he doesn't have to have Malaga wine every single house, or Manashevet's very heavy, syrupy wine. Now he has different Cabernets, he has Merlots, he's got fine selection. Whatever dawn on you, if we all believe that Elijah visits our homes on Passover night, which means he can be in more than one place at a time, why do we need to open the door for him? I mean, if he can be in so many places at the same time, certainly he can get through our doors without us having to open the door for him. Now, I'm not talking about chimney thing. That's, that's some other group. <laughs> but any type of way, I mean, come on. If you really believe, if you have faith that Elijah comes to your house Seder night, then certainly you believe that he can come through the door without you having to get up and open the door. So why do we open the door? Now you can say out of respect, but perhaps we open the door. When Elijah comes, when Eliyahu and Avi comes, is because if we want to open the door for this message of God's love into our homes, into our lives, then you have to get up and open the door. You have to let it in. You have to believe. And if you believe, if you open that door, that you believe indeed that Elijah's are there, that angels of God are there, that angels of God are watching over you, that every encounter in your life is something pre-planned by God, if you open your eyes to that, that's when we begin to truly feel these blessings in our lives. The more spiritual we are, the more we truly get to see and the more we experience. Suddenly all the props that we have on our stages of life are not just props put there by some producer of the play, but they've been put there by God Almighty. You know, when you have a, a Broadway production, every single thing on that stage is thought about, every color is thought about, every angle is thought about, every aspect of it is thought about. Well, God Almighty on his stage, the stage that he puts on, also thinks about every prop on our stage of life. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe and hit the notification bell below for daily pearls of Jewish wisdom.